Good evening, folks. Thank you to everyone who's here with us tonight at this special occasion in the, the Baker Center Ballroom, and to those of you who are watching through the live stream. My name is Dr. Chris France, and I'm a distinguished professor of psychology at Ohio University. And this evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce two members of our community who have the highest regard for academic quality and creative research. First, please welcome to the stage Ohio University's 22nd president, Dr. Hugh Sherman. Thanks, Chris. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. And it's a real pleasure to see such distinguished guests who are all gathered to celebrate um, Dr. Evans' achievements. So just out of interest, can I ask all of the distinguished professors to please stand? Just so everybody can see how many are here tonight. And we've also got two eminent um, scholars also, if they want to stand. <laughs> um, so this is a special night, and as, as some of you know, uh, we were all wondering whether this would ever happen. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Steve was actually awarded this in 2019. So it's been three years you know, before he, he got the recognition that he deserved. So we're really happy that he's had the patience to stay with us for these last three years to get this award. Um, as you all know, the Distinguished Professor Award was established by Edwin and Ruth Kennedy in 1959 during the presidency of John Calhoun Baker. It's a lifetime designation. It recognizes the achievements and extraordinary contributions of the selected faculty. Recipients of this award receive one semester of academic leave and the privilege of selecting one undergraduate student annually to receive a Distinguished Professor Scholarship. The Distinguished Professor Award is the highest academic honor of Ohio University, and it's a permanent recognition. Dr. Evans is just the 58th Ohio University faculty member to receive this award. If you think about that, the award was created in 1959. And we have gone through thousands of faculty members since that time. So it is a very elite honor. Dr. Stephen Evans is an outstanding faculty member who has reached the highest level of scholarly achievement and is worthy to carry on the vision and legacy of the Kennedy's Award and what they intended. In, uh, in the Ohio University tradition, Dr. Chris Francis will do, France will do the um, actual introduction. And I would like to just say a few things about Dr. France. First, he's internationally recognized for his outstanding scholarship and significant professional contributions to the fields of health psychology and behavioral medicine. He's published over 250 articles. Among his many professional service contributions, he's been editor-in-chief for two major journals in his field, has served as president of the American Psychological Association's Division of Health Psychology, and as a chair of the National Institute of Health's Behavioral Medicine Interventions and Outcomes Study section. He's received numerous awards for his work, including the Excellence in Health Psychology Research Award from the American Psychological Association, and he has been honored for the Ohio University as Presidential Research Scholar, as well as the Dean's Outstanding Teacher. I'm pleased to welcome back to the stage Dr. Chris Francis to make the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President Sherman. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce distinguished professor Stephen Evans. Dr. Evans received his PhD in clinical psychology from Case Western Reserve in 1990. After an internship and postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, Steve continued his career at the University of Pittsburgh's Western Psychiatric Institute. He moved to James Madison University in 1999, where he spent the next decade before we were very fortunate to lure him away to Ohio University in the psychology department. 
As a researcher, Dr. Evans has established an international reputation for his work on mental health care for children and adolescents. We all aspire to make a positive difference with our research, but it's the rare among us who can attest to being at the forefront of two major evolutions in our field. And Dr. Evans is one such person. First, in his work on treatment development for adolescents with ADHD, he has transformed a field that used to view children as growing out of their condition, but then recognized that as children with ADHD age, their challenges can persist, and interventions can help prevent a host of school and mental health related issues. Second, he was an early advocate for the development of a school mental health model, which expanded clinical intervention from the clinic setting to include school-based treatment as a means of enhancing access, engagement, and adherence. Dr. Evans' seminal contributions in these areas are accompanied by an outstanding, outstanding record of scholarly publications and a long history of funding from research sponsors at the federal, state, and as well as private sponsors. In addition, just to name a few of his many professional accomplishments, he is co-director of the Ohio University Center for Intervention Research in Schools, the editor-in-chief of the journal School Mental Health, and a recipient of the Senior Scientist Award from the School Psychology Division of the American Psychological Association. Lastly, Dr. Evans was selected as the 2019 Distinguished Professor based on his outstanding record of his accomplishments and the impact that his work has had on the field. Now, one of the metrics that we use to judge impact on the field is the number of some citations to one's publications, so how many times you've been cited for the research that you've published. With that in mind, I'd like to give you this fun fact. The number of citations to Dr. Evans's work has doubled since he's been awarded this distinction. <laughs> just, just three years. This fact is consistent with what all of his colleagues already know. Steve is a tireless and dedicated researcher whose positive impact on mental health care grows with each passing day. I've just cited a few examples of Professor Evans' extraordinary scholarly work. And now I'd like you to hear from Professor Evans in his own words in a short video presentation. My name is Stephen Evans and I'm a distinguished professor of psychology here at Ohio University. My wife and I uh, really enjoy Athens and the community surrounding it and we uh, enjoy traveling together, we enjoy spending time with our three children and um, they are all three alum of Ohio University. They all got their bachelor's degrees here. We also enjoy a lot of outdoor activities like cycling and hiking and kayaking and uh, uh, running. We have an incredible psychology department here with amazing colleagues who've been super successful and are very collaborative and it was such a wonderful impression my wife and I both got from the department as well as the community that uh, obviously we ended up coming here and it's been a was a wonderful decision. I view teaching as really two of the main activities that I do. One of them is mentoring students and mentoring others and the other teaching piece is more traditional teaching classes uh, that I do. And when I teach classes I really um, my goal is to help students think about things differently. It isn't just simply conveying information. So the focus of my research is on treatment development and evaluation research for adolescents with ADHD and other related problems. And I started this work a few decades ago um, before there really was any treatment development work for adolescents with ADHD. Um, at the time, it was in the 80s and 90s, there was this, the belief that children grew out of ADHD when they hit puberty, so nobody worked on ad with adolescents with ADHD. But, so I started doing that work early in the development of that field, and it's been fantastic. When you're successful, 
it has the potential to change the outcomes of adolescents and their families and really change the trajectory of their of their lives because adolescence is a time of potentially very risky behavior in terms of exposure to substance use, driving, sexual activity, all those things are going on and you can make mistakes that really send your trajectory in the wrong direction for a lot of years and children and adolescents with ADHD are at higher risk than others for making those mistakes. So when you can intervene and you can make a difference in that trajectory and prevent those kinds of problems, that's incredibly rewarding. Being selected as a distinguished professor was an incredible honor. I still vividly remember the moment that President Nellis called me to tell me I was selected as a distinguished professor in April of 2019. It, to have other distinguished professors at the university select you to be amongst that group was just remarkable and an incredible honor. So in terms of my accomplishments at Ohio University, uh, two of them really stand out for me. One is, um, it's actually been almost a decade now, I guess, uh, that ago that uh, Dr. Owens and I started the Center for Intervention Research in Schools. And it's a research center here at the university and um, involves other faculty, some in psychology, some outside of psychology. And the purpose is to improve um, the outcomes of children with emotional and behavior problems through interventions and services that can be provided in schools. The other thing is, and I alluded to previously, is to be able to play the role I've had the opportunity to play in the students that I've worked with in my time here has been, I view as an incredible accomplishment because when you see what they've gone and done and where they're working and what they've done is just, uh, and to know I had some role in helping facilitate that and get them on their way, that to me is an incredible accomplishment as well. Welcome back to the podium, President Sherman. I want to, I would like to invite Dr. Evans to the stage. <laughs> After three years, <laughs> thank you. Here is the certificate, and here's the portrait. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. All right, here we are. That still feels kind of unreal to me. I was waiting for the tornadoes or the ice or something <laughs> this afternoon, but I wasn't rescued by any of it. not on yet. There we go. So my talk is learning to make a difference and that's really been my career goal ever since the very beginning which I'll tell you a little bit about. But before venturing into that I just want to say first thank you to Chris France for that wonderful and generous introduction. It's been wonderful you mentioned coming here in 2009. It's been my pleasure to be able to know and to work with and have friends like you, Chris, and that's been uh, incredibly rewarding and very glad that Judy and I made this move, so thank you very much. 
as well as President Sherman, I thank you for your comments. And I also want to add a few comments uh, about President Sherman, not all of you. And uh, you know, he hasn't been president that long. But I want to tell you that back in the middle of January, the distinguished professors met with him and the provost, Elizabeth Sayers, and we wanted to uh, really work to enhance the research strategy here at the university to try to make uh, uh, to work to enhance the resources, the commitment to it, the support for the faculty. And one of the things we wanted to achieve by that was to be have this university become a top tier research one Carnegie rated university. Two weeks after that meeting, <laughs> Ohio University became a research one Carnegie rated university. I was like, well, this guy's good. <laughs> At the end of the meeting, I had, he asked if there was anything else. And I thought in jest, I said, you know, if you could do something about this COVID pandemic. <laughs> Ever since mid-January, the numbers have been going down <laughs> steadily. Now in science, we say correlation does not equal causation, but it makes you wonder. <laughs> It does make you curious. So thank you. You can't wait till you hear what we're going to ask next. <laughs> Finally, I, I mean, I also wanted to thank Ben Siegel. He took the, oh, there it is, took the picture. Um, he also was in the picture on the soccer field if you, that you saw in the video. And I was just going to tell Ben, unfortunately, he's out of town, that, I mean, he, he's an amazing artist with the camera. Many of you have seen his work. and. His picture of me was far more flattering than mine of him in the, uh, in the video. But also Chris Smith and his team made the video and I appreciate all their work and uh, to put that together and have it come out. And finally, Nick Clausen, who's on the president's staff who helped coordinate all of this and make this happen. That was uh, uh, wonderful to work with you, Nick, and I appreciate that. So I also want to, I will want to talk to you about some of the work I do in school mental health and with adolescents with ADHD. But I also want to convey something that's dear to me, and that is that nobody does this, or I don't anyway, achieve this level of success by yourself. You achieve this level of success with others because of your relationship with others. And I want to share a little bit of that. Um, and given that, there's no better place or there's only one obvious place to start. And for me, that's with my wife, Judy Evans, who is, from my perspective, the co-recipient of this award. She knows me better than anyone, and yet she still loves me. <laughs> I find that incredible. We celebrate our 40th anniversary this summer, and uh, I would certainly not be here without you, so thank you. But support from family is even more than that and began with me many years earlier. See, I took the color out of those pictures to make it look like it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, this is the family I grew up in, my two brothers and my parents. And my one brother, Keith, is in that, uh, all three of those, all four of those pictures. And he flew here from Dallas today so, uh, to be a part of this and attend this. So I thank you very much, Keith. I appreciate you being here. And then, of course, it goes to my family, uh, Judy and myself and our th three kids. And Adam and Emily are both here today. And I appreciate you being here. I'm very proud of you and love you guys very much. They are all three alum of Ohio University, and uh, that sure set them on a wonderful course. They're doing wonderful. And our family continues to grow. And now, our newest family members, one of whom is sitting right there, Sophia. Um, we have two granddaughters now, and they have been uh, watching our family grow. And I've often said this about grandchildren, at least for the last three years since I had one. Um, it's cool to see your grandkids and watch them develop, but really when they're infants, it's kind of boring. They're kind of in their <laughs> lump stage. But what's even cooler is 
to watch your son become a father. That, to me, was the most remarkable and amazing and wonderful thing to do. And Adam, you're doing it beautifully. Thank you. So it also takes out, in addition to your family, it takes some mentors. It takes people who help show you the way the, in the profession and help you with your connections and the lessons and how you to move forward. And I've been blessed with some amazing mentors. I, Betsy Short was my advisor at Case Western Reserve University and helped me launch my career wonderfully. And even prior to that, I, my first career was as a special education teacher in an elementary school. And my principal in that first elementary school was an incredible woman, Tony Kring, who just taught me the professionalism and what it meant to be a professional and working in that profession. And that was fantastic. But most notably, uh, the path to my career was made possible by one mentor who is also here tonight, Bill Pelham, who is... <laughs> who I began working with 33 years ago. <laughs> and I'm so very glad that I did. Uh, his support, his mentorship, and now his friendship. It is wonderful when a mentor relationship can develop and over the years become a friendship. And that's what I feel like we have now, which I greatly appreciate. And without mentors like that, uh, I don't think, I certainly wouldn't be standing here today. So. Thank you, Bill, for, and Bill came up from Florida, Miami to be here for this talk. In addition, it isn't just the people who mentor you, it's also the people you work with. And I've been fortunate to have some incredible colleagues uh, at Ohio University and around the world who have been, who make it fun. I don't want to sit in an office by myself and just do everything alone. I love working with other people. And this is some of those people who I work with. And it's been a, a fantastic journey. And they make a lot of the difficult stuff very, very achievable and very fun to do. And as uh, mentioned, I came in 2009. And part of the reason I came is because the psychology department here is really incredible. Um, the people, the productivity, the expertise. We have 18, currently 18 tenure track people in the, our department who are research, mostly research active. And within the College of Arts and Sciences, we have the second largest number of majors. And you can't do that without the right balance of both teaching faculty who are primarily instructors and faculty who are scientists and focused on science. And we have such strong expertise in both of those. We also have a nationally ranked clinical PhD program in the department. And we're consistently in the top five departments for research in the university. And that's due to a lot of people's contributions, a lot of, I think, brilliant colleagues' contributions. And I also want to note that while his name isn't on this list because he recently retired, the success our department is, has and why it's as successful as it is had a lot to do with our former chair, Dr. Bruce Carlson, who retired just a couple years ago, but uh, was an incredible leader of the department and instructor. So when you have good stuff like that going on, you have talented people here, you have people in a good culture, people working together, good things happen. And that's been the case for our department. Almost a third of our research active faculty are presidential research scholars, which is a high distinction for uh, researchers and scientists in, at the university. And we also have two distinguished professors and Short and Dr. France and myself, and when I came here, Ken Holroyd was also a distinguished professor here who showed a lot of leadership and I was very impressed with uh, when I arrived. So not only though, a great department, as was mentioned, uh, one of, and the place I consider uh, the, I'm most comfortable at at home is in the center for intervention research in schools. And it is now our, this year, our 10th anniversary. 
Dr. Julie and I, Owens and I co-direct the center, and we work very hard to create collaborative, supportive environment that students can feel comfortable. All of us can feel comfortable, make mistakes, and we all appreciate and benefit from each other's successes. And like that, and like the department, where when you put together such a good mix, when you put together the expertise of the faculty shown on the screen here and the culture that we all work together in, good things happen, right? For example, in the Center for Intervention Research, one of the recent events last year was the National Organization Advocacy Organization for Children and Adults with ADHD every year picks two to win their Young Scientists Award. The woman on the left is Melissa Dvorsky, who was an undergraduate here, and we've continued to work with as she went to grad school and on, and she's now a faculty member at Children's National Medical Center in DC. With, so with her background in SIRS, and the woman on the left is Sam Margario, who's one of my doctoral students now, and is leaving us to go to an internship in the fall, but Again, when you have such an environment where everybody supports each other and makes good, and our, we get brilliant people in here, good things happen. One more example of cool things happening when you have this combination and expertise is, many of you probably saw this year's Outstanding Faculty Award in Student Success was, for the MAC was awarded to Dr. Fran Wims, who's one of the faculty in our center. So again, Put in the right environment, productive people working together, supporting each other. It's been wonderful to come to Ohio University and be a part of all of this uh, network of colleagues and people. So I'm going to switch gears at this point after telling you how wonderful everybody is who I live with and work with and tell you a little bit about what I did. Um, this is where my career began, Haverhill Elementary School in just outside of Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was a K-5 to elementary school, and I was a brand new teacher out of Bowling Green State University trying to figure out how to be good and effective at teaching children uh, in special education settings and consulting. And one of the things about that school that has stuck with me ever since and is informs the title of this talk that you saw, is in large letters on the wall as you went into the front of Haverhill Elementary School was a sign that said, our goal is to make a difference. And ever since then, that's always been like my goal for all the things that I've done, like teaching and mentoring and research and practice. And not just trying to make a difference individually, but collectively, and learning how to better make a difference. That's actually why I went eventually into clinical psychology and got my PhD, because I saw that as a path of learning how to make a better difference for those same students I worked with at Haverhill Elementary School um, at the very beginning of my career. So what is learning to make a difference? And for me, it has become Research, helping children be successful, achieve their own goals, succeed socially, help them succeed socially and academically in the school setting. And the, um, I've used different tools to do that from being a teacher where I was practicing all day every day and working, spending hours with students in classrooms to now where I do more research, but I, my research is research on practice. So my career really got launched during my internship and um, postdoc fellowship when I went to work with Bill Pelham at Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. And I worked in the summer treatment program and it sent me in two overlapping directions. And I'm gonna tell you how and why uh, with both of those. But I wanna tell you just a little bit first, what is this summer treatment program that most of the faculty in our department have, or in our center anyway, have worked in in uh, one time or another. So uh, the summer treatment program is actually a summer, eight week summer day camp for children with ADHD. It's very structured. It's a very structured behavioral program. It's a high staff to child ratio. There's recreation time, there's classroom time, there's uh, social time. And it's a tremendous setting for doing treatment evaluation treatment development and evaluation work. 
Hi, Sophia. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> How's it look from up here? <laughs> so anyway, you want to see Annie M? So anyway, it's a tremendous setting to develop and evaluate treatments for these kids because you see them day after day after day and you can evaluate medication treatments, you can evaluate psychosocial treatments and all kinds of things. And it, it, it was just a fun and fabulous lab to work in. And actually, it's remarkable if you look at all the people who do treatment development research for children or adolescents with ADHD in the country, the vast majority of them have worked in a summer treatment program. And of those who didn't, many of them learned from people who worked in a summer treatment program at some point. So it's been the launching ground for not just my career, but many people's career. And that's been fabulous. So the first thing I want to, first direction I want to talk to you about in terms of how the summer treatment program got me started was the, in school mental health. And to start, I want to give you a little context. In the early 1990s, if no one used the term school mental health. There, there was very little school mental health to speak of. There was some psychoeducation, some wellness promotion kind of activities. There were things like that. But there wasn't school mental health in the sense that this kid has problem, emotional and behavior problems related to depression or related to whatever. And how, as a school, can we effectively work with that child to not only be successful at school, but potentially to reduce or alleviate the problems associated with the emotional and behavior problem. So that was a big change. And for me, when I was working in the summer treatment program those first few years, I kept thinking and even saying to people, this should be in schools. I mean, it's great that it's eight weeks in the summer, but why isn't it nine months in the academic year in those settings to help students who had those kinds of problems? And then that got me thinking a little more like, so why aren't all types of mental health services in schools? Why do we have such an artificial distinction between clinics and schools? Schools employ people with very similar degrees, right? There are school counselors and school social workers and school psychologists. They have almost the same training as most of the clinicians at many agencies, clinics, and hospitals that you would take a, a child to. So why not? use those resources and that expertise to make a difference in the schools. And they're a lot easier to see in schools. You know, the vast majority of children with emotional and behavior problems never get care of any kind. They don't go to a clinic, they're not identified, parents don't have the resources, whatever the case may be, they don't get care. But in schools, it's much easier. You can get, you still of course we need parent permission, but you don't have to take them anywhere. And you're not tied into this model of 50 minutes once a week uh, to try to squeeze a meaningful intervention into that you hope they actually act on when they leave your uh, clinic or hospital. And second, many parents go to school anyway to teacher, parent-teacher meetings and other things. Why can't they go to school for other reasons, to meet with a counselor or school psychologist? So, that got me thinking uh, that this didn't have to be this way and started thinking about, so if we did go to school mental health in a more formal way, what might be some of the advantages of doing that? And I, I only list a few here, I could go on, but uh, the, for example, being able to observe the child in the setting where he's having the problems is incredibly large advantage for uh, school mental health services. If I'm a clinician sitting in an office and I want to know about the problems the child's having at school, I might send a rating scale to a teacher, uh, and many places don't even do that. I might rely on just parent report or what the eight-year-old says. And that's not very useful. But if I'm a school mental health professional working at a school, I can observe in the cafeteria. I can observe in the classroom. I can talk to the school bus monitor about what the student's doing. I can get so much wealth and rich information about 
the child's strengths and weaknesses, that I'm going to, one, first have a much better image or picture of what are that child's problems and strengths than I ever could in a clinic. Uh, second, as I mentioned before, it's access to care. It's much easier for a parent to consent to get services while the child's in school than actually have to take them somewhere uh, many, uh, multiple times over many weeks. You can meet with the child as frequently and as for as long as you want for the most part. You know, there's nothing magic about a 50-minute hour treatment session, especially when you're working with children and adolescents. It's often much more effective to meet 15 minutes four times a week than it would to meet with an hour once a week. And you can not only have formal meetings, but you can stop by their desk in their classroom during the day and say, remember what we talked about with A, B, and C, or whatever the case is, that you, whatever you talk to them about. So you can build in prompts. You can teach teachers to build in those prompts. You can talk to uh, recess monitors about how to respond when he starts getting upset about things. You can extend your reach to so many aspects of a child's life. Nothing like that happens in clinic-based care. And the more I thought about it, I, uh, the more I sold myself on the idea that school mental health was a model we had to adopt. And I'm not naive about it, there are some disadvantages. So for example, if I'm in a clinic seeing somebody and I don't quite understand or have a good perspective on something about the child's care, I have colleagues and who with expertise in other areas, I can talk to and get that kind of consultation that's less likely to be available in a school. Perception of expertise, I did a study years ago looking at what parents thought of school mental health compared to clinical mental health. And part of what led me to do that was I was working in a school in Pittsburgh uh, as part of one of the programs we had. And I met with a mother and we talked about a number of things. And she said, oh, that's uh, all well and good and thank you for your time. But I think I just want to talk to a real psychologist at UPMC and see if they can uh, help whatever the child's name was. And I said, oh, that's great. Do you want to meet me at my office at UPMC? <laughs> And we can follow up and, and have that conversation. So it's just, it's a perception, but it isn't necessarily the reality, and that is a limitation. There are very different confidentiality uh, standards in schools compared to hospitals. And one of the biggest limitations is there isn't, how do you care for the kids into the summer? You send them to the summer treatment program, right? <laughs> but how, so you have that gap, and that is a limitation of school mental health services. So back in the 90s, there were a handful of folks across the country who started thinking about different models, like how could we do school mental health? How can we make it work? And we talked about currently evidence-based practices that are in place built for clinics that maybe we can modify or even expand and extend and use other, give them other levers and other switches to pull because they're in a school that'll allow them to do that treatment even more effectively than they might do it in a clinic. And we, we talked, we ex, not just talked about, but I, we put psychiatrists in schools and psychologists and counselors in schools. And we focused on universal interventions and psychoeducation. We talked about school-wide behavioral systems, behavior management systems, individual and group treatments that we modified to be just perfect for schools, not designed for clinics. And that took advantage of some of those things I told you about before. And then, of course, uh, consultation and staff training, but also progress monitoring. I and mean, that's something that doesn't happen enough in clinics, let alone in schools, but that was part of what we tried to design right with the school mental health programs as well. How can you tell if it's working? How do you know if you're being effective or not? In more ways than just a teacher rating scale that you might send to the school and hope that maybe you'll get back. Um, the two biggest models that really emerged in the 90s and uh, I've actually worked with both of them. It's the first one on the top there is invest in the training and the systems of the staff at school. So like I said, they have school counselors, they have school social workers and school psychologists. Can we uh, redesign what they do and train them and provide support and consultation so they can better meet the needs of the students, the emotional and behavioral needs of the students in the school in a way that they hadn't been doing in the past? And the second model there at the bottom is 
and this is still common too, contracting with outside providers. So for example, in this area, Hopewell has um, clinicians that they send out to schools to see kids in there, and they provide another additional resource and additional expertise. And there are advantages and disadvantages, again, to both of these. And as both emerged, there also began to develop hybrids or combinations of the two. And what we found actually can be the most effective is matching these, one of these models or some version of these models to the resources and the culture at the school with which you're working. And that's, uh, we found, has made the best uh, difference. And we've continued to do that um, over time and all the research that most of the research we do in the Center for Intervention Research in Schools is on models like this in order to how can we help kids with emotional and behavior problems get the services they need, effective services that they need uh, to, to improve their trajectories. So this is the last slide on school mental health I'm going to show you, but this is, I'm telling you a little, this story because it, uh, involves me going down a path that I had very little confidence I was going to be successful in, and I did, went down it anyways. And I think sometimes that approach is something that a lot of successful people can describe in their past, because I think that kind of risk-taking, and in hindsight, was wonderful. At the time, I thought, this is ridiculous. Uh, so I approached, I thought there should be a journal in school mental health. There are some journals that included school mental health related research, but no journal that was just focused on that. And I knew some people at Springer Publishing and now Springer Nature Publishing. And I talked to them about it one time at a conference and we had lunch or something. And what I really expected was them to say, uh, we don't really financially ready to launch a new journal at this time, or We've already talked about that with Dr. So-and-so at whatever university, and we, maybe that'll work out. Or we'll send it through the channels, and you know, by the time I retire, maybe they'll give me an answer. I expected some version of no, right? But I didn't get some version of no. Um, and I got a lot of enthusiasm, like, that's a great idea. We should have that. And we were at a conference. They went back. They took it to their administration. And with days, they said, well, if you'll help us write a proposal, we think we can get this through and get this journal launched and get it started. And I was like, I wasn't even sure I wanted to be the one uh, <laughs> leading this effort. I just thought it was a good idea. <laughs> and that didn't matter. Um, <laughs> So I, long story short is I continued to work on this with them. And the more I worked on it prior to this first volume, the more I thought, I'm not sure I'm really the person for this. I'd never been an associate editor. I'd only reviewed papers and submitted papers. And what made me even more annoyed was they never even asked me if I'd ever been an associate editor. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why do you think I can do this? Because I'm not so sure I can. Um, it reminded me of that Groucho Marx line that says, uh, I refuse to be a part of any club that'd be willing to take me as a member. <laughs> um, but anyway, I stuck with them and it uh, worked out. And one of the people, Tom Power, who's here tonight, was someone I relied heavily on at the time. He had been an editor of a journal and consulted with him quite a bit about how do I get this thing started? What's the next step? How do I begin? And um, the first issue was 2009, the year I came here. And uh, volume three, we, Tom Power and Lee Kern became associate editors of the journal. And now we're on volume 14, issue one just came out. we got our impact factor up to almost three, which is, from my perspective, uh, wonderful progress. I'm <laughs> excited to see it. But I also want to say, this isn't something you do alone, right? This is something you do with a team. And early on, Tom and Lee were my primary team and my source. Today, we have an incredible set of associate editors in disciplines of clinical psychology, school psychology, school social work, and counseling from across the country. And as it, I certainly couldn't do it any, this way alone. And it's been, it was an incredible roll of the dice and something I couldn't believe actually materialized, but it did. So 
That was the first direction STP launched me in. The second one was adolescence with ADHD. And as I think Chris mentioned earlier, uh, back in the 90s, pediatricians would tell parents, don't worry, they'll grow out of it. And the only thing that, the thing that most typically happened in response to that is, when the kids went through puberty, the parents quit trusting the pediatrician. Uh, <laughs> because they didn't grow out of it, <laughs> as you uh, can imagine. So uh, when I do talks now, for example, and I do talks on adolescents with ADHD, I often begin by saying, I work with children with a comorbid condition. They have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and adolescence. And most of them, but not all, grow out of one of those. <laughs> But it's been fantastic, and the, the way this began was a conversation with Bill at the summer treatment program. And a conversation might be a bit of an exaggeration. I was telling him, I liked working with the older kids. I was the lead counselor for like the 10, 11 year old kids. And I told him why I liked it and whatever. And he said, oh, you know, you should work with adolescents with ADHD, no one does that. That was the conversation that launched my career. <laughs> There was no more discussion, consideration. I thought, hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And one of the best things he allowed me to do then was I created a, a version of the summer treatment program for adolescents that was a blast. And we did studies in it and published uh, some of those. And that was important, too, from a clinical perspective. Because you, I think if you're going to do the most impactful research, you have to know your population. You have to work with them. You have to have spend time with them and experience what it's like to work with them and live with them. And I didn't live with them. But uh, <laughs> it felt like it at the summer treatment program. Uh, and, and, and that gives you so much better sense of judgment. So my first thought was, I think we need to figure out if the best practice treatments for children with ADHD might also be effective or even the optimal practice for adolescents with ADHD. And there were two best practices for children with ADHD at the time, and one was stimulants, which many of you uh, have probably heard of, Ritalin or Concerta or Adderall, and there are a variety of others. And just to give you a sense of what's, what, how stimulants work, what I often describe is, you know when you're tired and yet you've got 75 more miles on your drive to go and before you get somewhere, or you're reading a book, or grad students, you're trying to get this project done, and you just hard to keep your eyes open, you often take caffeine, right? You take it in a, some form of drink. Caffeine is a stimulant. And in some ways, that increase in concentration and focus that you get when you take caffeine to finish your drive or to finish your work is like in some ways, like what uh, children with ADHD experience in response to Ritalin and other stimulants. So one of the earliest, there were a couple before this one, but uh, one of the earliest papers uh, looking at the effects of stimulants on adolescents with ADHD was one I published with Bill in 1991. And as you'll see, even in when I'm studying stimulants, I'm still focused on school stuff, right? Uh, I, I, I never leave that special ed teacher vision of how, uh, how functioning and success for children. So anyway, the second thing, that's all I'm going to say about stimulants. Um, but the second thing and where my work is focused mostly has been on be, uh, psychosocial or behavioral treatments. And behavioral treatments are um, things that are uh, treatments that are based on opera conditioning or classical conditioning. And if you think back, operant conditioning, B.F. Skinner, and all of that stuff, and classical conditioning is Pavlov and his dog, and uh, the food and the salivating and all that, we're not going to really talk about classical conditioning, because most of the behavioral treatments for children with ADHD and other problems are based on Skinner's uh, um, behavioral treatments. And there are really two main tools that one uses in behavioral treatments. There's a lot of other complexity, but basically it's reinforcement and punishment. Right? Those are the tools of how we use it. And most other things we talk about with behavioral treatment involve using one or both of those potentially. And reinforcement is defined as anything increase the likelihood that you'll do the behavior again. And punishment's anything that decreases the likelihood, right? 
So some of the most common ways people think about behavioral treatments are things like sticker charts. And parents do them in the home, and teachers do them at school, and you earn stickers and points for doing certain behaviors, completing certain tasks, and that uh, can help the behavior of children with ADHD. But behavioral properties or behavioral influences work in all of our lives. For example, getting pulled over for speeding. That's a punishment. It decreases the likelihood that you're going to speed again. Well, for many people it does. Um, and that's what it's intended to do. As a brief aside, when somebody saw this picture, they said, is that Judy? I said, do you think I'd be having my 40th anniversary if I sat in the passenger seat and took pictures of her <laughs> in a situation like that? I don't think so. But anyway, speeding tickets, those are punishment for uh, inappropriate driving. It gets a little more complex as you get into adolescence and adult where you don't even have to experience directly the punishment or the reinforcement for it to affect your behavior. So if I'm watching these two women have a talk and the woman in black or navy may say to the woman in gray something about politics, for example, and the woman in gray responds in this manner, I, it's going to decrease the likelihood that I'm going to bring up politics to that woman. So it, that behavioral principle affected my behavior without me ever experiencing directly the reinforcement or the punishment unless I just wanted to antagonize that woman, then you might view it a little differently, and I'd bring up politics. But even more tricky, and even more subtly with adolescents and adults, is we develop identities, we develop values, we have reputations that we want to maintain or achieve. And if I do something that is consistent with my values and how I want to be perceived by others, even if everybody tells me I'm an idiot for doing it, if I'm convinced it's the right thing to do because of my values, I'm likely to do it again, right? I'm reinforced by behaving in a manner consistent with my values. Even though what you might see is everybody admonishing me for whatever the behavior is that I did, which typically would be a punishment, right? But if the punishment didn't lead to me decreasing the behavior, it actually, be reputation was the stronger effect. So, Behavioral principles do apply to adolescents, but they're harder for other people to manage. Uh, much harder than reinforcement and punishment for a rat, for example. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why. I'll quickly go through them, but just we don't monitor it. We don't see their behavior. They do a lot of it without adult supervision. Uh, effective reinforcers are expensive. You can't buy them a PlayStation every week for getting their work turned in at school. That you, it becomes very difficult to do something that's uh, salient. Social reputation often means more to these kids than anything a teacher or a parent can do. And uh, finally, most of the benefits of much of what you do, especially with teens, behaviorally, is gone once that contingency is removed. And it makes adolescents a difficult group to work with. And let me tell you briefly a, a, a case that exemplifies this. There was a principal who came to me and said, middle school principal, will you talk to the parents of whoever, this, uh, I forget the boy's name. They're really distressed and their child has ADHD and he was 13 years old, I think, at the time. And they came to me and they said they were working with the counselor and the counselor was teaching them behavioral parent training kind of things. And they were at their wits end because he was doing terrible in school. He was getting in trouble, he wasn't doing the work, things weren't going well. And he said, you know, they worked up this plan with the counselor that he would, wouldn't be able to be on the basketball team anymore unless his grades were improved at the next grading period to whatever standard they set. Um, and basketball was this kid's success, right? From an identity perspective, he was a basketball player. He wasn't a student from his own perspective. He was a basketball player. He loved it. He did well. well so he did, as you might expect, he didn't achieve the grades and they pulled him out of basketball in the middle. And then they felt terrible. They were like, now what do we do? Now he doesn't have to play basketball and he doesn't do his work and he, do, he doesn't have anything going for him. 
So they tried to say, okay, never mind, you can go back and play basketball. And he didn't want to anymore because they ruined it. And how do you go back to your friends? It was hard enough to have to quit. What do you say to your friends? But then now it's okay. He just wasn't into it. And now they had a worse situation than they ever had before. So many of, and there were lots of problems with that plan they set up with the counselor. But there, it's much trickier when you're working with 13 and 14 year olds and you can't control all these things, which is why it occurred to me, we need other tools. Uh, now be, we need behavioral techniques to work some, but we need other tools too. And so I started thinking about how do we effectively change behavior in other areas? And I looked at two things that I did a lot with kids and one of them was coaching and one of them as a special ed teacher was teaching kids to read. And the approach we take there is a what I call training interventions. And what they involve is essentially brief teaching of the concept, maybe modeling the concept, practice with coaching, and you do this ex over and over and over again. Kids took re take reading every day for long periods of time, right? Uh, for years in a row. And we monitor their progress. And what we're really trying to do is make complex behaviors that they have to think through automatic and achievable. So if you think about like someone learning to take a jump shot at the top of the key in basketball, they, when you first teach them, you're talking about their foot position and how they approach their spot, how they align their body, where they look when they shoot, their hand motion. And then when a player's first doing it, they're thinking about all those things. Let's see, are my feet right? Get this and do that. And they walk themselves through it. But with practice, 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 and coaching, and coaching, and feedback, it becomes one move. It becomes automatic. Well, I thought, why can't we do that for kids with ADHD in the areas that they have problem? Why can't we take a training intervention? Part of me thought the answer was because it's hard to, you can't do it in a clinic because of how often you got to see the kid. But we can in schools, so why can't we have training interventions for some of the major problems that kids with ADHD experience? And I felt like we could, and I felt like it was important to try to develop those things. But I also thought we had to take into account why these kids weren't learning to do these things in life to begin with. Because other kids were. They knew how to complete their work and to organize their tasks and everything. And I really got me into working with some of the kids and doing some reading and things. And I came me, led me to believe that disorganized thinking is at the crux of ADHD more so than inattention, more so than hyperactivity, more so than impulsivity. It's disorganized thinking. They, we all know that they're messy, right? Their materials are always disorganized. Their rooms are a mess. They lose things, they forget things. But also, it's probably not just with concrete objects and things that we see, it's also the way they think about things. And when they can't think about things that way. They can't recognize those interactions between other people. Like the two women, a child could have observed that and never learned the lesson if they don't see the cause and effect and connect the dots and organize what just happened and interpret it. They also don't establish patterns or routines. Like our lives are full of patterns and routines. It's how we become efficient. We do certain things a certain way and we do it always the same way and we don't have to end up thinking about it. If you're disorganized in your thinking, you don't establish those automaticities, those routines, those practices. So uh, I was at uh, James Madison University and decided to start a treatment program, a school-based treatment program for adolescents with ADHD called the Challenging Horizons Program. And there at the top, you see Brandon Schultz, who also came here from East Carolina University to be here today, who I've worked with for many years. But we came up with, uh, and the first five years we worked in this school, and we did an after-school program three days a week for two hours a day. And we worked with their students who had ADHD. We didn't produce or publish much research at all in those early years. We tried lots of interventions based on these, this training model and this disorganized thinking assumption. And we tried a lot of dumb things and a lot of things that didn't go very far, but we learned every time we did. And have actually developed a set of interventions that we then could study. And we came up with uh, training interventions for all these things in academic and interpersonal behavior. 
and ways that we worked with the adolescents with ADHD. And I'm going to quickly show you one of the things we did was simply a materials organization intervention. And it's fairly simple. The row headings there are things that uh, standards for how a uh, middle school student's binder or book bag should look. And when they came in every day, they were checked, yes or no, did it meet their book bag meet this criteria? And we did this three times a week for months for kids. And it took months before they were hitting like 80, 90% accuracy on any typical basis. And that is a training approach. And what we, what one of the like, fun things we saw is that sometimes the kids would be coming to the program after school and we'd see them or hear them in the hallways. They'd say, wait, fix your binder. Get it set before we go in. And some of the counselors thought, we should stop them. That shouldn't count. And for me, that was success. It's the first time they thought about it out of our program. <laughs> Granted, it was only a few feet out of our program, <laughs> but that's a start. And after months of that, they thought about it a little further away from our program and during the school day. And uh, this intervention has been uh, tried and studied, and I'll show you some examples for, uh, in other ways as well. So I know I'm going long, and I will, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, and so we started doing a lot of research on this, and we developed two models of the, ch of the Challenging Horizons program. One was a high-frequency model where we met with the kids for a long period of time and often, and another was a low-frequency model. And what we were interested in learning was, did this treatment lead to effects that lasted after the intervention ended? Because that, that would have been a big change in how uh, treatments we have available for these kids. And second, is it frequency that matters? Or is it for how long you do it, duration that matters? Or is it some combination of those things? And how can we then optimize those things? And our thought was we'd have to optimize them based on characteristics of the child. But are there some general rules we can learn? And so we studied these models. And I have to have a little data in this talk. So here you go. So the vertical column there is grade point average. And what you'll see then along the bottom is time uh, between the two vertical bars is an academic year, and our treatment lasted an entire academic year. So you can see that in the treatment period, the groups, and you can see the diamond here, is the high frequency where we met with them a lot. The block is a low frequency condition, and the triangle is a control group. You can see that the high frequency kids' GPA started to separate from the low frequency kids' GPA. And the part, though, that we were most pleased with is a year after the year after treatment ended, the difference between those groups got even bigger. And it wasn't because the treatment kids, uh, the high frequency treatment kids got better, it was because the kid, other kids continued to get worse and their GPAs were dropping down into the D range. And so, but nevertheless, that's a long term effect by preventing failure that we were encouraged by. Second, a study I just finished a few years ago with George DePaul from Lehigh, who's also here today. We looked at a high school version of that, and we again were interested in did the effects sustain over time. So again, we have our treatment year. The vertical axis is uh, parent ratings of how socially skilled their child are. And you can see the control, we only had a control group and a treatment group here, that the lines diverge rather quickly. They're also very far below the average range, but they get even further apart in the follow-up year. And that follow-up year, there was no treatment going on at all. This is different, though, because the treatment kids continued, the difference grew because the treatment kids continued to improve at a greater rate than the control kids did, which um, to me was a lot of progress. All right, I see I'm way over, so I'm actually going to skip a couple. I'm going to the summary. <laughs> <laughs> so training interventions appear to be helpful for adolescents with ADHD. And they can produce gains that extend well beyond the treatment, which to us was real exciting. There's differences between the benefits experienced by middle school students and high school students. And that kind of depends on the content, too. Like social functioning worked better with the high school kids. Academic functioning, we had a better response with the middle school kids. 
and uh, we learned a lot about the interaction between frequency, duration, content, and age. And that's a lot of interaction to try to figure out in terms of treatment, but that's what we're continuing to work on. And most uh, currently what we're actually work on, working on is kind of cool. It's looking at how can we increase the practice, right? If we can get kids to get more practice with more feedback and be engaged in that practice even more, we could get even bigger effects and get them even quicker and we wouldn't have kids who didn't want to do this dumb stuff anymore. If they could actually do it in a way that was fun and engaging. Well, finding agents for change or agents for practice, uh, a lot of people have tried different things. For example, uh, Howard Abakoff and Maggie Sibley both tested programs with that organization intervention where they taught parents to practice those things with their kids and to increase the amount of practice and feedback that kids got through the parents, which worked, was helpful with some parents, but not all. Whoops, I shot way ahead. Um, with high school students, actually, uh, Maggie Sibley also focused on getting peers to be practicing with the kids, and that that would, could maybe be more fun and actually something that would engage the kids. And actually, that was with high school students, with the middle school students, um, Elizabeth Capps, one of my students, is working on her dissertation to try that model in a middle school. But one of the thing, cool things that we got a grant for, and Brandon Schultz is here as the PI on, is, and if you know Brandon, this comes as no surprise, to use video games as a mechanism by which to augment the Challenging Horizons program to come up with ways to practice these organization things while actually playing a game, and then a mentor or an adult helps the child learn to transfer what they're doing in the game to real life. And we actually worked with our own grid lab here, John Bowditch and myself were the Ohio team. And we, had, uh, two, we have two graduate students who are both here tonight, Emma Rogers and Danny Vitucci, who are working on this project. And we're in the middle of piloting this at uh, Logan Hawking Middle School. And a few of the scenes in the game that are pretty cool, you see the students engage on this thing to prevent the destruction of Earth and their spaceships and warships and there's a home station where they gather clues and talk to people and answer questions and they figure things out and then they have to organize all those clues, organize them in a way that looks kind of like when you're taking notes, right? And then um, to actually win the game and to get successful. So I'm going to end with a couple final thoughts. And one is, there's still a lot to learn about how to make a difference for kids with emotional and behavior problems. And I love working on that with the amazing team of colleagues and students here at Ohio University. Uh, learning how to make a difference and also by working together, as I said at the beginning, good things happen when you have a culture and a collaboration and a supportive environment and people are free to make mistakes and we all celebrate each other's successes and that's just been an incredible experience. And I hope and I want to continue to invest in others, the students and the faculty and I appreciate all those who invested in me and that's a lot of what is the fun of what I do. So thank you for your extended attention tonight and um, I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Dr. Evans, distinguished Professor Evans. Um, that concludes the formal present, uh, formal, uh, our formal presentation today. I'm also reminded that uh, we have leftover cookies and other uh, refreshments out there. So if any of you would like to take them on your way home, please feel free to do so. And safe driving, and thank you for attending.